Coming up on Mayo Clinic Q&A. The COVID-19 pandemic has really had an adverse effect on us recruiting and collecting blood donors in general. As the general rule of thumb now in the this phase of the COVID-19 pandemic, it's pretty rest assured that we will need your blood type regardless of what it is. Blood donations typically drop off during and immediately after the winter holidays, which makes National Blood Donor Month in January a critical time for donations. If you want to make an impact that truly helps save someone's life, that meets them alongside some of the challenges of their medical care, the way that anyone can do it is to come in and donate blood. And if you are eligible, that unit, especially right now with as much need as there is, will have a profound impact on a patient's health and care on the other side. Welcome everyone to Mayo Clinic q and I'm your host, Dr. Helena Gazelka. Blood donations typically drop off around the holidays, making National Blood Donor Month in January an important time to share the message about saving lives by giving blood. Here to discuss the importance of blood donation is Dr. Justin Jeskowicz, Associate Medical Director of the Mayo Clinic Blood Donor Services. Welcome to the program, Justin. Nice to meet you and nice to be here. Well, I think this is a great topic because I don't think we talk about this often enough, the importance of blood donation. And so I'm excited you can tell our listeners about this today. How has COVID affected blood donations? It's a good question. So for many places, when COVID first hit the headlines, we saw this huge um, upsurging of blood donors coming in to donate. Um, but to be honest, since like the very first days of COVID, um, COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic has really had an adverse effect on us recruiting and collecting blood donors in general. And it really is a couple of things. Um, first of all, um, when everything shut down and there was social distancing and limiting of people being able to go out and about in the communities, um, that obviously led to a decrease in donors coming into fixed sites. Uh, like we have here at Mayo and like a lot of the major blood collectors have across the nation. The other long-term thing we saw though, in terms of donors coming in the door was that many blood collection agencies depend on mobile blood drives. Um, a lot of those are at schools, like high schools and places of work. For the high schools, um, there with all of these surges of COVID in the local area, um, there's been a, a restriction in the people that were able to come into high schools um, because it's feared to create a higher risk of having a COVID outbreak there. Uh, and then at workplaces, um, no, before the COVID pandemic, a lot of people worked on site at various lo work locations. So you could set up a blood drive at this given work site and all of the workers there could come and donate. Now, many businesses have turned to remote working. And so instead of all those workers being in one place, they're now distributed across their homes. And so that's really had a hit on having successful mobile blood drives at various work locations across the nation. Uh, so there's been a lot of headwinds. We've had to rely more on the few mobiles that we can have um, when opportunities arise and really depend on donors coming to us at fixed sites uh, for blood collection across the, the United States. So that has been quite the headwind. It's really interesting, Justin, because it COVID has really literally affected almost all aspects of life. And um, blood donation was not one that I had thought of, but that's really interesting. Can people who have had COVID donate blood? Yes, not immediately um, at the time of having COVID, but the FDA has indicated uh, to all the blood collection agencies in the nation that as long as a person is two weeks out from symptoms of COVID, they are allowed to donate blood um, of any blood product type. Um, and then for a particular subset of individuals who have recovered from COVID-19, some institutions are still collecting that COVID-19 convalescent plasma, the mm -hmm. yellow component of the blood from people who have recovered from COVID, help it's used as one tool in treating hospitalized patients with COVID. But the rule from the FDA is two weeks and two okay. weeks from your last symptoms. Good to know. In general, who is eligible to donate blood? So it varies a little bit from state to state in terms of age, but generally speaking, state laws varying, um, those who are 16 years and older 
and meet a minimum weight of 110 pounds can come in and donate blood. Some states it's 17, some states it's 16, but certainly all adults, um, as long as they meet the 110 pounds and their vital signs are within the normal range, um, they are eligible to come in and donate. Some specialized collection types have different weight and height requirements. Um, so your mileage will vary. Are there some individuals whose blood you cannot use because they're on certain medications or have different um, medical uh, diseases? Correct. That, it's an excellent question. And yes, there is. The FDA, um, the Food and Drug Administration, has laid out a set of medications that um, are make people ineligible, and you have to be off those medications for a prescribed length of time before you can donate. So some of the more common ones, um, isoretinoin, which is used for, which is Accutane for acne treatment. Um, certain blood thinners, because we will be collecting through a needle and we'll use the yellow part of the blood to help re replace some of those clotting factors. Uh, so things like warfarin, rivaroxaban, uh, adoxaban, apixaban, mm -hmm. those things um, have um, a deferral criteria. Aspirin, if we're collecting platelets have a deferral criteria. Um, and then there's kind of a smattering of other medications that could be a risk either to the donor's health because we're collecting through a needle through the arm or to the recipient who is receiving them. Um, but every blood collection agency will have, when you come in, that list of deferral medications. And as part of the questionnaire that's completed, required by the FDA, they specifically ask about whether you have been on those medications or not. How would I know if you needed my type of blood? So most blood collection agents at this point, um, start of 2021, the answer is pretty much we need all blood types. Oh. But many blood collection agencies either have web websites or social media posts that will indicate what the most acute need is. So getting plugged in, whether it's through Facebook and following them as a friend or through Twitter or through Instagram, um, or through their website um, and looking and seeing what their blood needs are is the best way. Um, I could talk specifically about some of the avenues. We have Mayo Clinic Blood Donor Center. We use websites and uh, various social media, media postings, but that usually is the best way. As a general rule of thumb now in the, this phase of the COVID-19 pandemic, it's pretty rest assured that we will need your blood type regardless of what it is. I have a few um, friends and colleagues who are universal donors or have a more commonly needed type of blood. And they often get um, contacted to see if they would come in and donate. How often can an individual donate blood? It depends on what you're donating. So a standard whole blood collection um, is eight weeks in most parts of the nation. Some places it's 12 weeks. Um, if you are donating platelets, uh, then that's usually about a week between donations and no more than 24 donations in a rolling 12 month period. If you're donating plasma, so just the yellow protein component of blood, it's usually 28 days between donations. And then some institutions are able to collect two red cell units at the same time using a technique called apheresis. And in most of those um, you require to wait 16 to 24 weeks, depending on the blood collection center before you can donate again. So it really depends on the type of unit you're giving. I imagine that there are individuals who have concerns about whether donating blood might affect their own health, whether there are diseases they could contract by donating blood or whether it would affect them adversely. Can you address that, Justin? Yeah, absolutely. So the risks of blood donation. So um, there are a few risks associated at the time of donation. Um, and then there's a one longer standing risk they'll talk about. But in terms of infectious diseases, um, the risk is zero. Um, as far as you being a blood donor and donating. Um, there is, uh, at the time of donation, when we're placing the needle in the vein, um, there is a small chance that you will end up with a small bruise at the site, like you would for any um, placement of an IV, um, or a small blood collection called a hematoma. Um, there is a lesser chance um, because we tend to place the, the needle in the elbow, on the other side of the elbow, in that where those veins tend to be. There are a couple small nerves that run through there, and so it is less than 1% chance that they can have some um, minor nerve damage that will heal over the course of weeks, so a little paresthesia or tingling. Um, so those are the things at the time of the donation. 
Um, as far as longer term, those individuals who donate products that have a lot of red cells, that whole blood donation I talked about, or that um, double red donation by that special technique, one of the long-term effects can be iron deficiency. And so all blood collection agencies have uh, policies and procedures in place to help safeguard blood donors um, from acquiring iron deficiency over time. Some places will spread out the time for donations to help the, the body recover and accumulate that needed iron from the diet. Other places will pro provide information as to iron supplementation um, options available or foods that are rich in iron to help replenish that, um, and specific instructions on how to take those in alignment with what your local um, primary care provider would suggest. So the big thing that we are most concerned about long-term is the iron deficiency, but there are ways of modifying diet or taking supplements to help with that. Um, and your local primary care physician, if you become a regular blood donor, can help you navigate what's the best option for you. At the time of donations, we test the amount of hemoglobin I was going to ask you that. Did before you? Uh, before someone can donate. So for women, you have to have a, a hemoglobin level of 12.5, men 13.0. Um, and the number one reason that we see across all comers, if their hemoglobin is low, is because they don't have enough iron. And so then we recommend those individuals to boost the iron in their diet or take iron pills for a short period of time. And usually those hemoglobin levels come back up. I'm going to guess we have many listeners who have never donated blood before and don't really know how to get started. What should they do if they're interested? Find your local place, read the online materials um, if they provide some online and show up, to be perfectly honest. I will say one of the best strategies, at least for me, when I became a first-time blood donor, and I've heard from a lot of the donors we have walk into our local donor center, is bring a friend who's done it before. Um, they can tell you about the experiences, but Quite honestly, it's really nice just having someone uh, alongside you during the donation process, if that's possible. Some places have social distancing and have to stagger their appointments now in the COVID-19 pa pandemic. But um, I say bringing a buddy is actually one of the best ways you can go through it. They can't be with you as you fill out the questionnaire and do the exam, you know, doing the blood pressure and the heart rate uh, and finishing answering the questionnaire. But oftentimes you can be near each other during the donation. And that's how I got through my first whole blood donation. I used to be terrified of getting blood drawn and I'm a, and I'm a transfusion doc. I used to be <laughs> terrified having my blood drawn just for routine clinical testing and I feel a little woozy. Having that friend who had donated before just come alongside and just hang out while we were doing that was, was a game changer for me. And it's been a game changer for a lot of people. But use Google or use your local search engine, figure out where the local blood collection agencies are, look at their website and give them a call. And they will literally walk, walk you through the whole rest of the process. That is a great suggestion, taking a friend. I love that. Plus, it's two people giving blood instead of just one. Correct. Anything else you would say to those who are on the fence about blood donation? I would say this, that um, I'm one of the more junior attending physicians in our division. We have several senior um, physicians who've been in practice 20, 25 years. Um, we have never seen such a long-term mismatch between the supply of blood coming in and the demand that we're seeing. The demand in the midst of this pandemic has been incredibly high, in part because our population is aging. And as the population ages, those individuals are more likely to need blood transfusions for the types of medical care they need. But also some people are still catching up from the care that they had to defer during like the early phases of the pandemic. And as a result, when they're coming in, their disease is a little more advanced and their need is a little bit more. So if you want to make an impact that truly helps save someone's life, that meets them alongside some of the challenges of their medical care, the way that anyone can do it is to come in and donate blood. And if you are eligible, that unit, especially right now with as much need as there is, will have a profound impact on a, patient, on a patient's health and care on the other side. So we have been imploring everyone who has been on the fence this is the time we need you most. And it doesn't matter where in the country you donate um, with all of the large blood providers, that unit will find a home to someone who needs it, even if they're further away from where you are. 
most places try to keep it local, but when there are acute needs or a blood product hasn't been used locally, there is a whole network to ensure that that blood product will find a needing patient and help meet them at that critical point in their medical care. That's wonderful to know because people don't want to think that their blood is being wasted. Absolutely. I always think too, Justin, that you never know when it might be your friend or your family member or you yourself who might need a blood transfusion or donation from someone else. Absolutely. So the take inventory, the time to give. Yeah, the inventory of today was the donations of yesterday. So when you right. reach that time of need or we have a, a huge disaster that happens and stuff, it's all those blood donors that came in the days before that are supporting that. Um, so paying it forward is also a really great way um, of helping take care of others. And then those others will be there for you when you meet your time of need. And a great way to start the new year. Absolutely. Thanks for being here today, Justin. Thank you so much for having us. And please, if you're eligible, go and donate blood. Our thanks to uh, Dr. Justin Jeskowicz who's a transfusion medicine specialist at uh, Mayo Clinic. He was here to talk to us about blood donation and we particularly encourage you to donate in light of the fact that January is National Blood Donor Month. I hope that you learned something today. I know that I did. We wish each of you a wonderful day. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org. Then click on podcasts. Thanks for listening and be well. We hope you'll offer a review of this and other episodes when the option is available. Comments and questions can also be sent to Mayo Clinic News Network at mayo.edu.